Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the last Psychosocial Wednesday of 2023. Um, I would like to start and <clears throat> to thank those that followed us this year. Um, we want to thank especially the IEAP uh, for their support, Institute of Freedom, they supported us from the production point of view. So I'm really thankful, especially to Luciana, Jonathan, and their team, and Isa, who has been with us for this year and translated for us an open psychosocial Wednesday to uh, South America and to the Portuguese language. And uh, also say goodbye to Institute of Freedom. This is the last time that will cooperate with us. So I'm sorry for those Portuguese friends and colleagues who, as of January, will not be able to listen to this in Portuguese. But Psychosocial Wednesday will continue. We have a full schedule for next season. The next season, 2024, will be our fifth season. So it is a miracle that we are still going pro bono. And with the help of so many people, again, next year, IAP will support us. And Pacifica decided to join us and to produce our events. So Pacifica Graduate Institute in California will help us. And I'm very, very happy about it. So Psychosocial Wednesday will keep spreading around the globe, hopefully. I want to thank Bernard, of course, one of the co-founders, Ludmilla, who joined in 2023, Mikal who recently joined, and next year we will have also Mansa, Chiara, and Kathleen who will help us. So stay tuned for the news for 2024. We'll start again on the 17th of January with our Swiss colleague, Christina Shelinsky, and she will talk about something very, very interesting, replacement child syndrome with a paper called Can You Choose Life Over There? Now, let's welcome our guest who is not here, because Elias Winterton was not able to make it, but our dear Elisabeth Berni will read the paper or interpret the paper, the paper for him, as always. And of course, let's do also some self-advertising. The paper we're gonna read tonight, listen, is from my edited book, which I usually call Freedom After Freedom, but actually has a very, very long title which I didn't choose, which the publisher, Rattler, choose, because I wanted to go for freedom after freedom, which is much more sexy. But the title is Individuation and Liberty in a Globalized World, Psychosocial Perspective on Freedom After Freedom. I'm only tired to read the title. The book is this, by I have three daughters and I need a lot of money because, you know, we write these books, but we don't make money. So, apart from the joke, I also take the opportunity to say Merry Christmas, Merry Chanukah, Happy Holidays, whatever, Happy New Year, and introduce Elias Winterton. Elias Winterton is an analytical psychologist and psychotherapist dedicated to expanding Jungian and post-Jungian ideas beyond the clinical setting. Very interesting, right? This interdisciplinary approach aims to apply that psychology to emerging fields of knowledge and experience. Elisabetta Taberni will read Elias' paper, Roots in a Pot, the Identity Conundrum in Global Nomads. And we can say without any doubt that both Elias and Elisabetta are truly neo unions Elisabetta, the floor is yours and thank you for doing this on behalf of Elias. <clears throat> Stefano, thank you very much. It's very uh, exciting for me to be here with all of you and uh, honored to be invited to take part uh, at one of the Psychosocial Wednesday, Wednesdays. And uh, well, um, I realized when you said you must talk for about an hour that uh, I I'm afraid I would uh, really... Uh, abuse of the patience of uh, uh, our audience. Uh, so I, I would like to make uh, this uh, meeting uh, as much as possible a conversation uh, or to facilitate the exchange of um, ideas and uh, comments around this topic. Um, I would like to say that the relationship between myself and Elias 
is very deep. Uh, so I feel I can interpret uh, his thought uh, in a, a rather um, truthful way. And um, because, um, well, you or, already presented your book, but I would like to make a, a little, um, to recall a memory from 2018, uh, a fantastic Congress in Frankfurt, where actually uh, I met you for the very first time. And I guess Elias was also there, at least in spirit. But um, that was a, a, a Congress uh, organized uh, uh, by Elizabeth Brodersen and Pilar Amezaga uh, uh, from uh, uh, for, for uh, the, uh, the International Jungian Studies Institute, and the the title of that congress was Jungian Perspectives on Indeterminate States Betwixt and Between Borders. There is uh, one of your first chapters, I guess, Stefano, in this book. Um, and um, I want to start from uh, one extract uh, of the chapter that I wrote as Elisabetta Iberni, uh, entitled Challenges to the Individuation Process of People on the Move. Um, because I feel that this uh, chapter um, explains at least the theoretical reflection uh, that uh, uh, provides the foundation uh, for Elias to write uh, Roots in a Pot and also to give you um, a better reference, a theoretical re reference of the metaphor of the roots uh, within the context of uh, individuation and identity in the so-called third culture kids or cross-culture kids. Maybe um, someone of you um, is familiar with this notion, but I'm going to um, um, discuss it with you in a second moment. Um, for Isa, who needs to translate, I'm at page 28 uh, or uh, at the beginning of the uh, paper that I shared with you, Isa, uh, at first. Um, please let me know if you um, are okay with it. Um, in a globalized world, increasingly dominating dominated by the perverse rules of neoliberal markets and advanced capitalism, the phenomenon of migration dramatically highlights the massive structural differences and inequalities that are generated by this system. Goods and information can move without restrictions across the globe in a much less problematic way than people. In fact, someone some people are entitled to fully enjoy the right of freedom of movement across borders, uh, which is uh, ensured by Article 13 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, while others are pushed to a condition of inferiority and, and denied um, enjoyment of the same right. In the contemporary world, subjects embody their biopsychosocial power while being embedded in specific historical, economic, and political circumstances. The human consequences of globalization have been described by the Polish philosopher Zygmunt Bauman, who observed how the reality of modernity is contributing to the individualization and fragmentation instead of unifying. And since we are always on the move, physically or psychologically, humans experience profound psychological effects than even before. And the construction of their identity unfolds in a mutual dialogue, shaped by personal experiences occurring in a certain psychosocial realm and in a process of co-construction with others. 
media and their language can powerfully influence the social and cultural realm so as to frame and actualize the identity of people on the move by applying categorical distinctions. Thus, often these categories are taken as object of academic and empirical research to, prov to improve the quality of social and clinical intervention targeting individuals and families on the move. If not carefully examined, these assumptions might grasp only a partial understanding of the subjective experience of these people. Aiming to unpack and tre trespass the rigid boundaries drawn between these categories, I will use this lens of analytical psychology together with concepts extracted from the mainstream of relational psychoanalysis and intersubjective theory in order to observe the experience, the subjective experience of these groups across a continuum dimension by indicating four common aspects. The archetypal experience of home, the impact of potentially traumatic life events, identity and belonging, and individuation. Jung conceived the process of individuation as a series of synthetic movements between, between ego and self in order to achieve a sense of wholeness. In his writings, Jung described the movement towards self-realization mostly as an inner personal project moving from a rather aristocratic position than looking through the political collective and democratic realm. And um, this point has been discussed by a prominent uh, uh, post jungian such Andrew Samuels abundantly. Individuation and the shaping of the sense of identity cannot take place in a vacuum, but implies belonging to a wider relational and external matrix. In a sense, individuation refers always to engendered bodies and encompasses the process of raising political awareness of one's own position in the collective life. And in order to fill this conceptual gap and to integrate the Jungian theoretical framework, I propose using the idea of rhizome, uh, introduced by Deleuze and Guattari, and further elaborate, elaborated by post-humanist philosopher Rosi Broidotti, who created the notion of nomadic subject. I suggest this conceptual association by drawing on the immanent and non-dualistic view of mind and body endorsed by Jung. And, uh, for a discussion on Spinoza's influence on Jung's work, uh, Shandasani in 2003 has um, discussed more in depth. Um, as he illustrates discussing his idea of psychoid archetype, cosmic unit, unus mundus and synchronicity. Well, the less thinking and further the nomadic thought are solidly grounded in the materialist monism, rejecting the fallacious Cartesian division between mind and body. And both Jung and Deleuze borrowed from Spinoza and Berson a vitalist materialism position, materialistic position that allows extending consci consciousness beyond human rationality, embracing even inorganic matter. Another conceptual point of convergence between Jung, Deleuze, and the theory of the nomadic subject refers to the immanent quality of desire. And Jung embraces a theological view where individuation is foreseen as the constant movement towards the achievement of the totality and wholeness of the self, while in the latter, the desire corresponds to an ontological force of becoming. Exploring in depth the connections of Jungian psychology with postmodern psych philosophy, and in particular the debate 
um, to debate the affinity between the Deleuze interpretation of analytical psychology and the points of contact between Jung and his philosophy is beyond the scope of the paper. In particular, um, a thorough analysis of uh, Jung's original ideas with the tools of the Deleuzean thought and debated of the anti-foundational criticism uh, posed by different uh, um, post-Jungian authors has been um, the subject of uh, a paper by Macmillan. Um, According to Macmillan, different concepts have been marginalized to minimize the foundationalist epistemology adopted by Jung and the consequent dualism that has important ethical implications in clinical practice. Well, using the lens of Deleuzean and nomadic philosophy to reread Jung's definition of individuation, can provide a useful tool to overcome the liberal individualism discourse implicit in its historical definition and explore an alternative connection to the relational and feminist psychoanalysis. The Lusian philosophy and nomadic thought rely on the major insight offered by psychoanalysis pointing to the capacity of thought processes to follow a self-organizing structure in a dynamic manner, while at the same time being single and multiple, independent and interconnected, such as archetypal action patterns and emergent structures, quoting Hoganson. Geographical dislocations represent an existential condition involving a growing number of subjects, Moving to new places and relocating can present specific challenges in achieving individuation and a coherent sense of identity, as it requires the capacity to face tensions between opposite, opposites, such as local versus global culture, familiarity and strangeness, integration and marginalization. Drawing on the notion of trust transcendent function, this paper explores the possibilities of creating a third symbolical dimension embedded in the matrix of uh, relational experiences um, and conditioned by specific social, legal, political constrictions that can emerge from the meaning meaningful encounter of individuals and new environments. In this direction, people on the move can become carriers of diverse and original values and mediate between distant symbolic and cultural worlds. I attempt to describe this third meaningful dimension by formulating the concept of global citizenship as a psychological state of mind drawing on three main ideas. The first is Jung's notion of the individuation process reinterpreted through the Deleuzean philosophical lens. The second source is Hannah Arendt's ideas of world and worldliness, um, and Smith's argument on the cosmopolitan virtue involving the adoption of a self-reflexive mode of being in the world. So the cultivation of a heightened care or feeling for the world and the ability to adopt certain skills in the manner of our disclosures to the world. And the third concept is Benjamin's ideas of thirdness, Jessica Benjamin, as a space of intersubjective acknowledgement and mutual recognition with another. The paper describes uh, the people on the move uh, dividing them in three main categories, considering uh, that um, these categories are purely artificial and uh, um, that people can uh, find themselves to experience uh, one position uh, in, in one category, but also move to other categories. And the, these main three groups 
uh, are defined as uh, refugees or dislocated people, um, migrants, and uh, expatriated people or members of uh, the international community. And the third culture kids are um, part of this last group. Um, the paper um, in particular uh, focuses on uh, um, the idea of um, identity. And I guess that I would like to focus on this definition uh, on, on this exploration of identity development and the development of the sense of belonging that um, it's uh, uh, very um, interesting in um, children and but also in adults uh, that have been exposed to uh, forced moves and when I mm, um, reflected having worked in uh, post-conflict environments uh, as Elias um, and uh, uh, but also being myself uh, um, migrating in uh, rota rotating uh, across different countries um, regular more or less regularly for after medium um, periods of time I, I find um, that uh, the process of uh, developing uh, self-awareness and identity uh, can take and needs to take multiple perspectives uh, in order to um, allow a, an integration that give uh, coherence. And uh, I will um, still focus on um, a few paragraphs of this paper on the challenges to the individuation process uh, before moving to the clinical case uh, that it's uh, exposed in, in the paper Roots in a Pot and treated by Elias. Um, <clears throat> um, I, Isa, I am... Um, in uh, the um, paragraph called Identity, Development, and Sense of Belonging. I hope you can find it. It's a few pages after the beginning. I guess page uh, six or seven. Writing in 1912, William James distinguished between I the self as knower and doer, and me, or myself, as known or experienced. Identity is related to individuals' self-sameness and continuity in time, and the other's recognition of these qualities also. The self includes a material, a social, and a spiritual dimension. The construction of self-identity can take place only within a matrix of affective relationships with a significant others, an important aspect described in relational psychoanalysis. Refugees, migrants, and global nomads cope with the common challenge of dealing with changes between places, languages, familiar faces, beloved friends, any points of reference, culture, and so on. Quoting Bowman's use of liquidity as a metaphor, when he observes that liquid life is a precarious life lived under conditions of constant uncertainty, it is possible to say that people on the move have fluid lives and deal with the effort of maintaining a solid self-identity having to negotiate their sense of belonging and intimacy within a new context. Adopting a conceptual framework to understand some specific aspect of the subjective experience of people on the move might provide a useful tool for the clinical practice. 
and uh, aiming to construct such conceptual framework to understand some specific aspect of the subjective experience of people on the move, I'll try to integrate the idea of the multiplicity of self-experiences uh, as described by Jung and the notion of reason discussed by Deleuze. As mentioned before, Jung not only considered that the psyche has a natural tendency to splitting off, he assumed that partial components of the personality could be autonomous and empowered as events which depend on the typical organization of the psyche, visualized like a chain of islands or an archipelago. According to Jung's perspective, the real mystery is rather how the psychic identity can be maintained, which is a recent evolutionary conquest relying on the enduring integrative work of the ego complex. And it was Redfern to extend the Jungian notion of self and noting that Jung used the word self to describe a totality or mainly to point to uh, not me force, which is usually not experienced clearly by the conscious I. For Jung, the self is placed over the ego often overlapping with the subjective I. The ego is for Jung a complex, as complexes remain largely unconscious, like sub-selves, affective consciousness and behavior, but most of the time avoiding a direct relationship with the I. Redfern referred to the self as a migratory self, migrating either and tighter to various locations in the total personality, like the spotlight at a theater picking up first one actor and then another, or even more pertinently, like a pilgrim on his journey of life, visiting one place, then another in his universe. Redfern considers that the looseness of the I in its attachment to the various sub-personalities of the individual results in a readier migration of the I feeling between the different sub-personalities. Moreover, the multiplicity of the self-experience is an idea theorized by object relation psychoanalysts who have noticed the influence of the relational matrix and intersubjective dialogue, as well as the harmful impact of interpersonal trauma. Here, I see that the notion of raison created by Deleuze and Guattari has a useful complement to the Jungian intuition about the multiplicity of the experiences of ego and self. This conceptual integration might allow a better articulation of the process of identity in general, but especially for people with a movable life. The notion of the raison offers multiple ways of engaging in making sense of the fluidity and fragmentary nature of belonging and identity. A rhizome as a subterranean stem is absolutely different from roots and radicals. Bulbs and tubers are rhizomes. Deleuze specified that the notion of the rhizome is symbolic in both theory and research that allows for multiplicity, interconnection, and fluidity in making sense of belonging and identity, whereby no one theory and or method can be said to have priority. It affords a way of considering the complexity, the complexity overlapping layers of theories, philosophical underpinnings, multiple identities, cultures, and belongings, which continuously evolve and interlink with a variety of concepts and ideologies. They describe the notion of rhizome as based on four principles. The first defines the rhizome as its connectivity. They say, as is the potato or any structure in which each point is necessarily connected to each other point in which no location, 
may become a beginning or an end, yet the whole is heterogeneous. Jung describes the capacity of the self to produce connections in these terms. The self is relatedness. The self only exists in as much as you appear. Not that you are, but that you do the self. The self appears in your deeds, and deeds always mean relationship. The second principle common to both the Rizom and the Jungian self is their multiplicity. And Deleuze labels the Rizom as a multiplicity rather than a multiple. Resting in any relation to the ego complex is subject to natural and has to relate with many other complexes negotiating sometimes power position. In principle shows the complementarity between the two concepts and is called the asignifying rupture against the over-signifying breaks, separating structures, or cutting across a single structure. A rhizome might be broken, shattered at a given spot, but it will start up again on one of its old lines or on new lines. Jung defines the trauma at the basis of the complex creation. The rhizomatic conjunction end and end as the rhizome has no beginning or end, and it's always an intermezzo, in between. Because Jung's definition of transcendent function, and in particular of the coniunctio, unifying opposite meanings in a third meaningful symbolic dimension. And the fourth principle is the deterritorialization, which considers that the reason likewise resists structures of domination, such as the notion of the mother tongue in linguistics, though it does admit to ongoing cycles of what Deleuze refers to uh, as deterior deterritorializing and re-territorializing moments. In analytical psychology, the ego moves continuously from and towards the self throughout the individuation, or as described by Fordham, the self de develops through a constant process of deintegration and reintegration in order to achieve unity and wholeness. And, uh, well, I guess <clears throat> uh, that um, in within this theoretical framework, uh, which is uh, um, maybe um, not exactly enjoyable uh, when you read it out in this way, uh, I guess it's possible to imagine a better um, 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 development or extension of uh, the Jungian theory uh, more able to capture um, and, and to provide conceptual tools to understand uh, uh, present realities that are um, coming to the attention of the neo-Jungian clinical practitioner. Um, in, before to, to continue, and uh, I would like to uh, possibly make um, a connection now between uh, my paper uh, in, uh, on the challenges to the individuation process for the people on the move and roots in a pot. Um, I would like to, to move to the topic of uh, third culture kids. Uh, and, and the process of individuation uh, or uh, development of identity, first of all, as described in, uh, in literature and, and in the research uh, conducted on this um, very interesting um, 
group. Um, I am in a pot and uh, uh, starting from page 167. Um, until 2000. Well, um, the concept of third culture skid, and I would like to to ask uh, um, how many uh, people are familiar with with the third culture kids studies and. Uh, um, mm, context um, as a curiosity to know how long I, I, I can keep. Uh, yes, uh, Stefano, you, is, you want to take the floor, I know, please. No. Um, maybe in the chat, raising hands. Um, Okay, I will, I will not go into deep details, but I feel that it's important to um, give an historical introduction to this concept uh, because it makes a huge difference um, to consider the historical period. Uh, um, the, the begin, at the beginning, um, this term, was introduced by two soci sociologists, um, Ruth and John Usen in, in, 19, in the 60s. And their, um, their initial intention was to study how US uh, Americans who lived and worked in India during post-colonialism and after World War II would interact with their Indian colleagues and vice versa. And also observing power dynamics among the two groups. Well, these um, US uh, citizens were living in India. So their in attention were, was uh, dedicated uh, predominantly to American children who lived their childhood years outside the country of citizenship because of a parent's employment in a representational role abroad. And uh, um, during, um, this was the, the um, context of research uh, at the beginning of the study, uh, of the creation of this term. But during the last three decades, um, anthropological, psychological, and developmental researchers aim to bring to light the emotional and psychological realities that come with the third culture kid journey. And Pollock and Ruth Van, uh, David Pollock and Ruth Van Recken uh, uh, wrote their two main books in 2009 and in 2017. Currently, the term third culture kids describe, describes children of expatriates, missionaries, military personnel, and others who live outside their passport country due to a parent's choice of work or advanced training. Um, and TCKs are considered a subcategory of the much wider group of cross-cultural kids, where in this group uh, we could say that um, migrants and refugee kids are, are also included. Uh, and with this term, they refer to individuals experiencing a cross-cultural childhood for different reasons. It's interesting to observe that until 2000, most research on TCKs focused on uh, psychological trauma, reverse culture shock, alienation, rootlessness, marginality, non-adjustment, homelessness, and lack of identity, primarily at the time of re-entry to the home country 
and in their teen and early adult years. And these studies included TCKs who becoming adults could articulate narratives relating both the pain and the gain of these multifaced identities. Um, interestingly, in the first study, uh, in one of the studies, the differences of TCK's childhood experiences in third cultures were analyzed, taking into consideration several variables. The age at which they lived overseas and returned to their passport country, um, where impact appears to increase with age. The pa parents' sponsor, if they were belonging to a family um, where the parent was working for the diplomatic service or military or uh, missionary or corporate kids. The mobility of the family, the length of time overseas uh, from one to 18 years abroad, limited experience of life as a member of a home culture, experience of the host culture as a culture they connect with, in terms of local practices, values, language, without belonging, and experience of the home culture or the, of the country of parents' citizenship as the other, especially after the repatriation. Uh, well, in, as a result, uh, this study showed that TCKs experience a physical and internal dislocation feeling either in one place or in another at the same time, and neither in one place or another. And Pollock clarified that TCKs builds relationships to all of the cultures while not having full ownership in any, and explained that TCKs sense of belonging in its, in, is in relationship to others of the same background, Hence, TCKs identify with this shared experience term third culture. Furthermore, TCKs feel that mainstream labels and categories aiming to encapsulate them as adults into one group are uncomfortable, as these descriptions um, are inconsistent with their self-definition and too restrictive to describe the complexity of their subjective experience. Consequently, adult TCKs often report a lack of deep connection with national communities, but rather prefer connecting with others who share analogous pasts. Adult TCKs recognize as a common identity to relate to similar others the pluralistic sense of identity derived from having a third culture childhood, creating an instant sense of community. The third culture is for me, uh, says Elias, a shining examples of the liquidity of psychosocial experience of a sharply increasing number of individual, individuals across the world. It is an abstract interstitial ethos created from the shared experiences of persons from a variety of cultures, but living the same mobile international lifestyle. Paradoxically, in TCKs, the differences are the fundamental elements of their identities that create a sense of belonging. In this sense, TCK's hybrid identities can transcend boundaries of geographical places or nationalities, allowing TCKs to find their roots to interstitial places and cultures in a both and way rather than having to choose either or. Um, it is um, quite clear, uh, for me at least, um, the, that uh, the um, way Pollock and Verrecken um, conceptualize the um, um, group of uh, third culture kids uh, can uh, be better understood uh, at, um, within a Jungian perspective, um, but also 
incorporating the extension uh, provided that by by the Deleuzean uh, philosophy and the idea of uh, uh, the raison as a interesting uh, metaphor that provides us a powerful um, active imagination uh, to um, accompany uh, the journey of uh, and the individuation journey uh, of uh, of these individuals that um, are particularly challenging within a clinical setting, and I'm going now to touch upon uh, the the clinical case um, in uh, the case of Muriel. Uh, because I guess that uh, it, it will uh, um, um, unify, connect um, many ideas that have been explored so far. Um, Muriel, uh, the case of Muriel um, can be um, considered a typical example of a member of Generation Z. Uh, in my view. Um, and um, McKinsey, um, in um, a recent study, has, has provided, um, based on a Brazilian sample, by the way, um, a, a sort of profile of this uh, group, gen Generation Z, born from 1995 to 2010, um, and define them the cohort of true digital natives. And anyway, um, I, I don't want to um, focus on, on this study, but um, present Muriel uh, as a, 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 an example of a third culture kid uh, that has become a young adult um, and um, faced uh, the liquidity of a nomadic life. Um, in, um, in, in this case, um, there are uh, several um, interesting entry points to understand the dilemmas that working with the third culture kids and adults can bring. Um, for the clinician. Uh, the first one is the, the paradoxes with the profound sense of loneliness and alienation, living in both a virtual and material reality, pervaded by variations and endless possibilities. The second focus on the cycles of transference and counter-transference Synthesis and analysis. The patient and the analyst co create a safe container to elaborate and transform omni omnipotence, um, negative projections, and dissociated traumatic experiences. And the patient's experience that initially cannot um, be told start to tessellate, reconciling the divergent opposites and creating the capacity to hold mindfully the conundrum of the identity. And uh, in, in, as a third angle, um, the case of Muriel um, uh, bring up uh, um, the paradoxes of gender identity or the, uh, uh, in this case, uh, um, spiky path uh, of uh, gender identity uh, for Muriel, who expressed the desire to be recognized and validated as a non-binary person. And um, um, the case, uh, in this case, we use the term they to um, perform an inclusive language. Um, the Briefly, the patient's background um, is that Muriel is a 23 years old student in political science, uh, who is a, a very energetic, ironic and sensitive young adult with a remarkable artistic talent in photography and in music. 
And uh, Muriel enjoys her, their friends, uh, show a genuine curiosity for the surrounding and uh, more distal world, human rights, civil rights, the environment and global politics. The academic performance remain below their potential and this kindles frustration and envy. Um, as a, uh, it, their original uh, place of birth, it's a country in South America uh, with a mono-ethnic society, religious and traditional culture and an uh, authoritarian political system. Uh, Muriel remembers the, uh, her life, their life in the country until the age of eight. Um, during the first two years of their life, um, uh, they live uh, with their mother and the father's grandparents in a little, little town. The first memories refer to the birth uh, of a sister uh, when uh, Muriel was three years old. Um, at the age of eight, the family makes the first move to Mexico due to the father's diplomatic ca career. And these years um, are remembered as very dark. Uh, Muriel showed signs of depression, missing the caregiving grandparents, and in particular, suffering after the sudden death of the grandmother. Uh, Muriel's condition uh, was unrecognized and non-validated and uh, the family seemed unable to connect and elaborate the losses and the negative emotions uh, related to these family events. Uh, when they were 12 years old, the family relocated to Australia, which Muriel remembers as a chunk of their life as a roller coaster, getting to know the open and multicultural society, the enthusiasm for learning and education, but also the terrifying experience of sexual abuse. Then Muriel, when uh, Muriel turned 16, they moved to New York without them, their family to start college studies with a scholarship. And during these American years, um, two younger twin brothers uh, were born uh, and, and Muriel discovered uh, diversity, uh, became aware of sexual, relational desires, sensuality, gender identity and uh, a new sexual orientation. Uh, moving to Europe was uh, after again four years and, uh, um, and then uh, these this uh, move was uh, special because they had to go back and live with the family again. And this represented a powerful setback that made Muriel regress to an earlier stage, reignited the old hated feelings towards uh, their mother and created a sense of disorientation for not being able to reconnect with the father. And at the beginning of treatment, the main complaint was a sense of confusion and uh, feeling muddled with regard to aspects of their life and aware of their authentic needs and desires, terrified of remaining stuck in this uncertainty and precariousness. And uh, the feeling of being immersed in the fog uh, was a, um, very dense also in the counter transference of, uh, of Elias, of the therapist. Um, for several months, four months, um, the um, therapeutic dialogue remained stuck. And um, Muriel says, it's like being immersed in the fog. I cannot see my thoughts, ideas, preferences or desires. I cannot detect the shapes and the directions of the things I have inside. Sometimes I fear of looking at all these things. Other times I'm afraid to discover being empty. But what terrifies me the most is being unable to understand who I am and what I can become 
and I need to find it quickly, uh, found out quickly. The reason why it must be done quickly is that uh, uh, the diplomatic status of the family is going to expire in a few months and the risk is to have to go back from square one. And Muriel, um, uh, for the first time, um, realizes the precariousness of uh, all this life and cannot really um, connect uh, with a, a solid and stable sense of self. Um, in uh, the, the counter transference is, uh, uh, as said, very powerful. And um, feelings of shame are um, also investing uh, the somatic sphere um, of, of the therapist in a rather massive way. Uh, and, and this is linked also to the experience of abuse that was uh, um, completely dissociated and uh, through the unfolding of uh, the therapeutic relationship could be um, um, uh, slowly uh, mentioned and, and then explored. But there are several levels of uh, uh, traumatic, uh, invisible traumatic experiences and losses. Another uh, aspect of, of uh, Muriel uh, that might be important to mention and refers to, uh, to her freedom um, is the um, non-binary gender identity that she um, affirms, uh, almost confronting uh, the boomer therapist. Um, and it's... Um, an element um, that um, also um, mirrors her uh, sensitive, creative nature, uh, but from a clinical point of view, uh, might be connected with a sense of uh, um, defensive omnipotence and uh, fluidity uh, here plays a, a a double role, uh, on the one hand as a defensive mechanism, but also as a, a creative solution to make emerge a third possibility uh, that helps her uh, to uh, overcome the conflict of being identified with a very negative mother, very narcissistic and neglectful mother, so as perceived, uh, and the risks of identifying with an aggressor, which is a powerful uh, defensive mechanism, especially uh, facing sexual abuse uh, in uh, pre uh, during prepuberty. Um, and, 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 and so ex exploring his, uh, their masculinity uh, could uh, um, give uh, this sense of uh, self-protection, -pro but at the same time uh, um, embodying the sigizia, this combination of anima and animus. Um, the end of the of the of the therapy, or let's say the, the the latest development of the therapy, and I am going to close uh, my presentation here in a moment. Um, refers to um, um, re-elaborate uh, and uh, in a dream um, some uh, important elements, uh, vital elements of her um, relationship with the feminine and the relationship of the um, uh, maternal grandmother, which was uh, possibly the best caregiver, the most positive, caring, fig authentically caring figure that she had lost uh, dramatically uh, and, and this loss remained unresolved uh, when she was a child. Um, the uh, images of um, um, land, uh, hearth, um, uh, ground, um, um, th there are... Um, 
um, body sensations during the period of uh, shame and silence and mud and fog uh, that refer to um, the nature uh, of her um, mother country, uh, of her home country. And uh, in these um, images, um, it's easy to um, be um, led to the uh, image of the rhizome of the Leuze, of these roots uh, that goes, can go everywhere and take uh, um, and be interrupted and start again. And uh, she, um, she feels that um, her interrupted identities now need to, to, to restart uh, towards a direction. She makes decisions on what to do uh, in terms of uh, finding a job, becoming a, a, a digital content manager. So elaborating her nature of digital native and uh, the need and 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 finally um leave the family or at least uh, um be uh fred from the uh, dependence on the uh, diplomatic privilege status of the father and the in one of the last sessions this dream indicates that the um through the analysis Muriel could achieve a better level of uh, differentiation and individuation. I am traveling in New York's underground with all my family and I am surprised because also my grandmother is there. I know she's dead, but I am excited for being able to talk to her and hug her. I am careful to warn all my relatives that we need to step out at the next stop. They actually ignore or don't listen to me. I finally get out of the metro and in a moment I realize that I left all behind me, my bag with money, cards and documents and my family, including my grandmother. I am in panic in front of a new place, feeling so vulnerable and disoriented. I try to breathe deeply and then I put my hands in my pockets and I find new keys and identity cards. I'm sad, alone in a place that I don't know, but there are posters with reassuring messages inspiring a better future for all the people. I follow the path and climb the stairs, going to explore this new place and new life. And well, I would like to conclude here, um, um, observing that the case uh, study of Muriel suggests the chance to develop and refine theoretical ideas that can inform and guide the analytical process and therapeutic work with global nomads and with the third culture kids. But um, this case proposes to reflect on the importance of extending the boundaries of analytical psychology with an innovative conceptual framework that integrates also the uh, social dimension. And Bauman and Beck eloquently describe the effects of the globalization on the life of individuals and the massive impact on their liquid intimate relationships, family conditions, working conditions, mobility and outlook on the future. Precariousness, uncertainty, and vulnerability are the common experiential denominators for a large majority of individuals who can enjoy many sorts of freedom, but also suffer alienation and mental pain. I stop Thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank you because apart from this beautiful, actually amazing lecture, every time you give a lecture, is amazing and also with the help of Elias it seems that Elias was or is a very good grandma for this patient right <laughs> especially when looking at when looking at uh, the last dream which is so Jungian I mean it's so Jungian that it seems unbelievable to be to be true but you and I that as you said met in 2018 and had the chance to know each other and then meeting in Vienna it was so nice to meet you in Vienna again and in other occasions. Our work really overlap. 
not only because we are two Jungian psychoanalysts that draw from sociology, you for, from certain sociology, and me especially from Beck, and then Bauman and Giddens, but because we are looking at the formation of identities at the beginning of the 21st century, really at the crossroad of psychoanalysis of whatever kind of sort for us a bit more Jungian and sociology. And we're also underlining that sociology is very important, but is not really grasp the essence of psychoanalysis. And we, especially the Jungian, will benefit from sociology of whatever sort. So really the psychosocial realm is, is there. Uh, we even use similar words, you know, you say hybridity uh, or hybrids, and I say merging. But at the end of the day, is really the precariousness of liquid life that creates problems or the precarious freedom are the problem of, of liquid life. In fact, my next book is called Absolute Freedom, which really goes in line with, with your idea. But I have a question for you before I open the floor and, and I hope people will ask a question. Uh, everything makes sense until you talk about the mother complex or the negative mother. So what is the difference between someone who is not a third culture adult, let's say first culture adult, yeah? Let's say us, me and you, born in Italy, raised in Italy, let's say, or Ludmilla who is here, German, German, or the Brazilians that are here, right? And our kids because my kids are, as yours, third culture. So what is the difference between an adult that suffer of the same trauma, for example, losing the grandma that was the caregiver, having such a negative mother figure, between third culture and first culture? Thank you, Stefano for this question that gives me the opportunity also to clarify the technique strictly uh, uh, in, a, in a strictly technical sense you and I would be considered um, also um, a third culture adults yeah. um, I'm not sure uh, if this is because when you create a theory you know that the more you include uh, no. new categories, the, the sexier the, your theory can, or more attractive the theory can, can be. Um, but certainly, I, 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 I think that um, compared to an individual that uh, um, never moved from the, 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 the culture, of, uh, of, of the first culture, and, and sometimes the first culture is the culture of, of the family uh, across generations. Well, I guess the, the, there it's possible to see even a, a, a deeper gap. Um, what uh, I want, my quest, your question brings me also to reflect on how fast and massive psychosocial changes occur so that children um, are not only exposed to the third culture, to, to a different culture than ours, or become third culture kids, but they are also immersed in a, a fast changing world yeah. um, that, that uh, sees massive transformation and uh, children are, um, especially, especially at least in, in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, my daughter is growing, uh, these changes are uh, immediately um, transferred in educational uh, modules and, and inform uh the, the the awareness the self-awareness of children um in a, in a uh informing their individuation from a, a very early stage uh, the negative mother complex i guess that trauma um is experienced um by human beings uh, in a rather universal way. 
uh, what can make a difference um, in terms of uh, the capacity to absorb and elaborate a trauma is the environment, the relational matrix uh, that uh, surrounds an individual. And um, I guess to, the, the, there might be a factor of vulnerability that remains uh, underestimated, I guess, in the literature on third culture kids. Um, and vulnerability sometimes can be also a superpower, but you must be aware that first it's a, a vulnerability. Um, the um, um, unresol I, I guess the unresolution of the grief uh, of the grandmother refers to an absence of uh, a, a, a holding environment that, that could allow uh, the child, the, the Muriel as a child to uh, become aware and elaborate the negative emotions. Mm, and the negative mother complex refers to the qualities of uh, the caregiving of the mother that Muriel mm. describes. We don't know if the mother is really as Muriel uh, described, but certainly the traits of a narcissistic um, were there mother and, uh, or a negative mother complex could be a, an easy simplistic way to uh, to report an aspect uh, of vulnerability that that can uh, yeah, create a ground for um, a resolution of traumatic experiences yeah thank you Please raise your electronic hand, because if you raise your real hand, I cannot see you. We are more than 20. Um, while you formulate, I, I, I want to ask another question, but oh, there will be no need to be answered because then there will be a real question. I'm trying to make time. But these, your, your work really expands on the notion of cultural complexes as developed by Tom Singer and uh, Sam Kimballs, uh, because they're concept i would say is modern and not postmodern or late second modern because it doesn't include that I family agree. of people that really are a mixed mesh of culture as i write as you commented here somebody born in south america that marry somebody European and they move to the US where they create a family, they have kids, and then they move to China, for example. So what is the conundrum there? Yeah, and we will only see, we will only see. Um, please raise your hands, ask questions. This is your last chance. And, and Elisabetta wants to say something. No, no, I was just uh, um, waiting for um, other other comments, also comments, not necessarily questions. Um, I'm happy to... Also also in Portuguese, uh, and, uh, and uh, Isa, our dear Isa, will translate it for us. Um, this is really innovative research, eh, Elisabetta. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. And uh, we... Jungians need more and more of this, more and more of this. Did you, are you planning, are you or Elias, you and Elias planning to present it at the conference in Zurich? Uh, we are considering it and um, um, uh, maybe um, one of, of your questions or provocations, it's also pertinent to to this discussion and uh, you mentioned also the cultural complexes and I guess that um, at this point I wonder if um, uh, focusing on differences and cultural complexes tend to capture the essence, the identity of, of, I totally of a culture. If this, is this necessary, or should we consider um, dimensions that are more uh, in, including really liquid? Really liquid. Uh, li yes, 
um, as for the gender identity, um, it, this is a conversation that I have also with, with friends sometimes. Um, do we really need a gender? Do we really need um, to categorize? Uh, mm, I know it's, it's really a provocation. Um, I see somebody nodding. It would be nice if this person who is nodding would uh, participate. But I know this person is very shy and reserved. So I will not say the name. Um, yeah, true. Listen, let me say something because I see the audience is shy. But so we have a conversation uh, and people uh, they, eventually they will step in. I just came back from China where mm. I did some a bit crazy that was to present a paper that I presented two years ago in Torino about uh, what you said basically individualization so back Obama liquidity individuation Jung and actually gender or gender diversity or genders in China and uh, so basically talking about freedom and the freedom of gender identity um, at some point, I realized that the translation was not working behind me. So I stopped after two minutes and I asked for simultaneous translation. And there was a colleague that stood on the stage and translated for me. So it was really beautiful what happened after. Many, many colleagues under 30 came to me privately, basically to say, this is something we never heard of. This is something we need more. So we need also to go in that direction, not only here in Europe, not only on our analysis and activism list, but really to be ambassador of a thought or ideas that for us are innovative. And that could be also for countries that are on a, diff let's call it this way, different system, right? To support not only them with our work, but also with their own personal development. People came to us for supervision because these things are not discussed openly, right? All right. And um, there is a, the chapter um, in, in your book of uh, Galit Atlas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That is a Israeli American uh, relational colleague mm -hmm. based, based in New York. Dreaming your future, dreaming your freedom. But also, uh, also, sorry, the impossibility of freedom mm. from psychoanalytical conceptions to political objection. And I guess, uh, Stefano, this would uh, go south, this conversation, if um having worked also with the colleagues of the Serbian developing groups um I guess we we need also to be mindful to the political objections and uh, um, when uh, approaching uh, colleagues working in different uh, political and cultural contexts it might be mm, uh, very painful to um, come across to the, the um, uh, sometimes risks and, and limitations that they truly face in becoming they, analysts, in becoming they, uh, analysts, in in working as uh, analysts in in context that politically perceive as a threat. Um, the introduction of, of these ideas. Yeah, and this also makes me think that um, we thought with the globalization, with the liberal economy, as you mentioned at the beginning, that we were free, we are free. Bauman Beck described it. I think it is an illusion when there is no individuation. So individualization, the the freedom described by Bauman, Beck, Giddens of the post-traditional society, second life modern society, is not true freedom, absolute freedom, as I call it, without individuation that is going through the work that Muriel, for example, went through. 
With this, I thank you. It's always wonderful to listen to you. Likewise, uh, I I truly um, I'm very grateful of your invitation. Elias is also very grateful, but I am um, I I truly appreciate um, the the patience of the audience, and uh, well, I wish you all the very best, uh, and and for those who are. Uh, living in a warm temperature, Isa uh, and uh, colleagues in Brazil. Um, take care, stay safe, um, and, and uh, all the best wishes from The Hague. Thank you, Elisabetta. Thank you, everybody. This is the end of our fourth season. So see you in January for our fifth season with our colleagues. Nationalski. Merry Christmas, yeah. Merry Holidays. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.